Inshallah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So today we will study the chapter seven of Hill and Mayer on externalities. So we start with this ayat. Alhamdulillah min al-Shaytan al-Rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Zahar al-Fasad fi al-Bir al-Bahr bima kasabat ayd al-Nas. So, in this ayat it is said about how the earth, the land and the sea are destroyed because of the evil deeds that people do. So, um, the main point being made in this chapter is that when you do something it has a cost to you which is your individual cost and it has a cost to society which is the social cost and these two are different so basically the conventional economic analysis is based on the assumption that individual costs are the same as the social costs and if this is so then the cost benefit analysis works all right but if the individual cost and the social costs are different then there are serious consequences so uh, all of the argument that we saw last time or time before about the efficiency of markets takes into account that if the benefits are high and the costs are low then the production should be increased but the question is whose benefits and whose costs so if the benefits to society are different from the benefits to the individual and similarly the cost to society are different from the cost to the firm then all of this argument is invalid and uh, what the textbook says is this is the general case that the what the one person pays is not the same as what it costs to society so it may be that the individual has incentive to produce lots and lots because he is not paying all of the costs somebody else is paying the costs so the example that is given is that of driving now uh if you look at the private cost of driving uh it is uh, small and so you, you do the same supply and de- demand analysis that we did um last time to calculate the efficiencies then um, you get the picture in the first half of this diagram the private cost of driving is constant and the benefit of driving private is yours now there's one assumption that social welfare is the sum of the private welfare this is another problematic assumption because um there is social welfare and there is individual welfare then there is individual choice behavior and the, all of these three things are different but taking that part for granted your demand curve reflects the benefits of driving and the costs of driving are your uh, basically your per kilometer cost of running the car but it may be true that there is a social cost of driving that is there are many other costs like when you drive out on the road you cost uh, you create congestion you create pollution uh, there are risks to the public of uh, accidents so um there is cost that of the wear and tear on the road which is a public good so all of these things mean that the social cost of driving is higher than the private cost of driving and if that is so then the right cost benefit analysis is given on the right hand side suppose that there is an extra 7 cents somebody actually calculated the 30 33 cents is the private cost to the driver and then 7 cents is the additional cost to society 
So then actually the marginal cost, social cost is 40 cents. So instead of driving 230 kilometers, the right amount is much less, 170, because uh, then the social cost will equal to the benefit at least. So when there are costs to society which you are not paying, then you will tend to overproduce and there will be as a result uh, congestion of the road, wear and tear of infrastructure and many other costs which other people will pay and you will not. Like if you do pollution then health costs will be borne by everybody else. So So uh, economics textbooks mention this problem and uh, they have two solutions. One is Pigovian tax based on Pigou who analyzed this situation. He says that you can increase the private cost by adding a tax. So for example, every if, if it's seven cents that's the additional social cost then you put a tax, a road tax, and you add uh, any time somebody drives, he has to pay a tax of seven cents. And so if this money is collected, at least the marginal cost will equal uh, the marginal benefit, social cost, and so the amount of driving will be reduced. There is another uh, solution which is also mentioned in the textbooks, and that is that Basically, the reason that these externalities cause problems is because there is no market for them. So, uh, the problem is caused by missing markets. If there was a market in which the benefits and the uh, costs could be traded, if there was a good, so for example, the good is here is the air, and uh, if you are polluting the air, then you're causing damage to others. So if somebody owns the air, he can charge you the price for that pollution. And so um, this solution is to create a market. So anybody who wants to do some pollution by driving a car, then he has to buy a permit for pollution. So this is one of the uh, ideas. So basically, if there is something in which you have uh, something that is not owned by anybody, then doing damage to it doesn't cost anything. So the solution is to create ownership, create property rights, give somebody ownership. Now this is actually uh, the mindset created by the market, uh, by, by the idea that markets are perfect and they solve everything. And actually it doesn't work very well in practice. So for example, um, many people have tried to privatize the water supply and the electric supply, public goods which are common and it has resulted in what everyone intuitively knows but the economists don't understand that if the uh, company has control over water and people need water then they can charge extremely high prices and so this happened and in many, in many cases where this was done, people had to revert back to, uh, uh, to public control because the private companies just were causing too much trouble in the sense that they were out to make profits, they were not out to provide a service, whereas the government has to provide service. Uh, profit making is not subjective. So, um, if you create a market for something, then you leave yourself open to the possibility of monopolistic exploitation, uh, which we have also seen, as economic theory says, is possible. And so um, the idea of creating markets would work only if you can create a perfectly competitive market. And the idea, uh, that idea is false. It's very hard to create perfectly competitive markets. So this is not a solution to the problem, but economists don't understand this. There's a, 
um, common problem which is called the commons problem like if you have the oceans which are open property for everybody or if you have common ground where anybody can take his sheep to graze then since again this is another instance where the private rights private benefits from grazing are high uh, the cost is not paid by you because the uh, land belongs to the public so then uh, what happens is that everybody puts his flock there and that destroys the grass and the land and then it doesn't uh, regenerate so similarly overfishing can destroy all of the fish and they will not reproduce and then they will be damaged to the whole society but for any individual uh, consumer any individual uh, fisher he is not the source of the problem so he can overfish but the collective action of lot of people causes damage to society so now um, in all of these cases uh, these problems have existed uh, for centuries and people have found ways to solve these problems that is uh, they um, talk to each other and agree with each other on what should be done so uh, for example even in um, times of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that uh, for if you have common land then let the rich man with the large flock not use that and let the poor man with because they have the, uh, the first of all the rich man with the large flock can easily destroy the commons so and also he has the resources and the wealth to take his flock far away and uh, the poor people should be allowed to have access to the grazing land so this was one solution but in uh, many many societies many areas have been shared and people have worked out rules so that everybody can live together because basically um, in in england there were lots of common lands before the massive privatization that took place and there were well defined rules of how people uh, how how people should share and what rights are there and who is allowed to do what and so people evolved these rules because people live in a society and the human beings have learned to cooperate over uh, a long period of time and cooperation is the natural mode with which human beings operate so uh, recent research shows that this problem of commons arises in economic theory because economic theory doesn't have any theory of society it only has theory of individuals so actually if you put people down in a situation where there's a commons problems they will figure out a way to solve it because they this is something that people are good at but uh, economic theory says that every individual must act for his own personal individual selfish benefit and with that theory then it's uh, very difficult to solve the commons problem now standard theory of public goods this is one type of an externality um there are two properties that public goods are said to have one is that it is a non rival which means that once you have the good everybody can there is no marginal cost to producing the good so everybody can take advantage of it so rivalry means that if i have it that you can have it and if you have it then i can't have it and so the good doesn't have this property it's a common good like the atmosphere if i'm breathing then it doesn't prevent you from taking advantage of it and similarly a radio broadcast is the same uh, some of the goods are non excludable that is i can't uh, prevent you from taking advantage of it. these are two very close and similar properties it's hard to distinguish between one and the other but um, so there is a classification that there is rival and excludable this is the normal uh, good that economic theory deals with so there is an apple it is rival if i eat it you can't eat it and it's ex- excludable i can prevent you from yani um, if somebody owns it then the other person cannot own the same thing uh 
Now, some goods are uh, rival and non-excludable. So, for example, if you have fish in the ocean, then if I catch the fish, you cannot catch the same fish. Uh, but the ocean itself, I cannot ban because it's common property. Anybody else from trying to fish in it. So, the goods, the fish in the ocean are rival, but they are not excludable. Everybody can go and fish. And then there is non-rival. So this is the example is a computer program. Now once the program is in existence, anybody can use it. You are using it, doesn't prevent me. And But uh, you can put copyrights on it and make sure that um, it's used only by one. So artificially you exclude people from using it and create scarcity when actually the marginal cost of reproduction is zero or close to zero. Uh, then there is the non-rival and non-excludable. So if there is a radio program that's being broadcast, then I can't prevent somebody else from bringing in his radio, so that's not excludable. And also, also non-rival in the sense that my using, it doesn't prevent anybody else from using it. So these are the common terminology, but um, there is uh, difficulty in making, uh, making this classification. So the major concern of, of econ economists in this scenario is called the free rider problem. So if, we, if there is some public good that will bring everybody benefit, so we say let us all pool our money to buy this thing, then uh, the benefit goes to the whole society and so uh, there is a mismatch between the uh, private cost and private benefit and the social cost and social benefit. So typically what will happen is that the uh, benefit to society is large, uh, but the cost to the individual is large. And uh, <coughs> so uh, as long as if, if everybody else is paying their share, and if one person does not pay, uh, it will not cause any difference to the public supply. And, and uh, so he can sort of free ride on the benefits. So for example, tomorrow there is an important election and, or a vote on some very important issue which makes a big difference to me. But I know that the majority of the people are on my side. And so as long as everybody votes, then even if I don't vote, uh, there is a lot of cost to me in getting up and going to the booth and putting in my vote and the benefit to me is small and assuming that the uh, the private benefit to me is small because the as long as everybody else votes then uh, I have no um, then the outcome will occur which is beneficial to me so I don't have to worry so the social benefit and the marginal benefit and, and the private benefit and the social cost and the private cost are very different. And so everybody has incentive not to vote. But if everybody reasons it that way, then the other party can organize and get the vote. And this often happens that the small organized minority gets its way and the large disorganized public uh, does not. So uh, this is called the free rider problem in the sense that if there's a public good which everybody should pay for, if you don't pay for your share, um, you get the benefit anyway. Um, so the basic issue is that the problem is that the way that the economists analyze the problem is based on a wrong uh, understanding of human beings as being selfish and actually human beings have a lot of social tendencies so economists cannot visualize the solutions that can be made to work basically what one needs to do is to change social norms to make sure that people cooperate and make sure that people feel responsible and we know all of we all know examples where you know people are made to feel that yes this is your responsibility you have to do this job even though it is personally costly to you, but 
this is something you have to do for the sake of the society, etc. This is something which is very common line of argument used in so many different places. So, for example, Mao Zedong took, uh, was concerned about uh, the use of automobiles, so he, he took a bicycle to work, and so everybody started taking bicycles, and this, of course, reduces pollution of the roads, gives you better health, and many other public benefits accrue. So, um, In uh, Tokyo, they in Tokyo they have a lost and found department, and they created a campaign in which uh, they gave the citizens uh, and they put advertisement that look, if you lose something, then uh, how bad you feel, and so. Uh, they uh, change the public norms and so in Tokyo if you drop your purse with thousands of uh, yen in it or lots of money, the chances are very high that it will be returned because there is a public uh, perception that this is the good thing to do and they have made lost and found booths where you can just turn it in. Whereas in other cities where they haven't made run this campaign, then it doesn't happen. So the fact is that people can be made to act cooperatively to look for the public interest instead of their private interest. Uh, this fact is not part of economic theory. So that's why economists have different types of problems with this issue then. Now, um, Joan Robinson uh, said that uh, when Pigou analyzes the problem, he makes it appear as if this is an exception, that sometimes externalities happen, but most of the time this is not the case. But actually, if you look at the world around you, then the exception is lack of externality. Most of the cases that we deal with, the externality case is much more common. And so, um, again, just like the case of the uh, perfect competition, which is very rare. The case of monopolistic com competition is common, but the textbooks present the matter in the opposite way, making it appear as if the um, perfect competition is the normal state of affairs and others are uncommon. So just like that, the textbooks in economics make it appear as if the externality is an uncommon case and the common case is lack of externality, when in reality it's the opposite. Um, these externalities are uh, very serious and very important, and they are causing, they cost millions of lives every year, and they are threatening to make the planet uninhabitable. Um, they are involved in our daily decisions every day, and the, uh, the way the textbook put this out is just by uh, a rhetorical strategy. They note that there is such a problem and then they forget about it and they have one special chapter on externalities which treats it as if this sometimes some sort of a rare disease which happens uh, very infrequently and they don't understand that this is the standard. Now, the fact is that externalities do create very difficult problems which are hard to solve and in particular they cannot be solved by markets and it's rather difficult to get them resolved by the government. Uh, governments act on the behalf of the powerful usually because the just as re regulatory capture occurs so governmental capture also occurs by the powerful elite and it's very common. And so public, instead of taking actions on behalf of the public and the masses, the government takes actions which benefit the rich and the wealthy. Now, <coughs> the economic theories are part of this uh, process by which the interest of the small group is imposed on the uh, public and basically the soft power 
uh, occurs by misleading and deceiving and misinforming people. And this is uh, much more important than the hard power, which is in the form of guns and, and police. It is uh, false theories which are more uh, powerful in terms of leading a very large number of people to behave in ways that are uh, useful for the interests of the wealthy. So now let's look at some real world externalities. So the most important example is the greenhouse gases. Now the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, nobody gets uh, and it, it's, it's a huge cost to the entire planet, which is it's causing global warming. Furthermore, there's a threatened uh, chain reaction that if there's too much warming, then the ice caps will melt and there's lots of greenhouse gases, gases that are trapped under the ice and these will be released. So there will be a geometric uh, expansion in gases which will actually make the planet so ha hot as to make it uh, unbearable, uh, uninhabitable by human beings. The ocean levels will rise, so all of the coastal areas will be drowned, and uh, water levels can by be led by a large uh, amount. Now, um, people have been uh, worrying about this and trying to solve it, but really no progress has been made. The Kyoto Protocol was uh, agreed upon in 1999 and came into effect in 2006, but there has been no actual change as a result of this. Uh, greenhouse gas emission has not gone down. Uh, why is this? Well, the problem is difficult to solve because of some uh, serious uh, issues. One is that the effect is not immediate, so we will not pay the price, it will be paid by somebody else in the future. Uh, furthermore, it's a global problem, it requires coordination. If I reduce greenhouse gas emissions in my country, uh, other people can take benefit and, and it increase theirs. And so, because the costs are, uh, it's a planet-wide phenomena, so uh, we have to have act in cooperation. And so basically, the, there's a big battle, political battle. What the powerful countries want to do is to impose more costs on the weaker countries and the poorer countries. And the weaker and poorer countries want that there should be equitable sharing. For example, Pakistan produces very little in the way of greenhouse gases, but it is paying a huge price. So. Um, the equitable formula and, and advanced industrial production and nations produce a lot of gas. So the right formula would be for them to pay the large price to indemnify the countries that they are damaging, but they don't want to do that. So they want to use their power to prevent the costs from coming on them and let all of the other people take the costs. And so there's no, because of this political dilemma, there is uh, no agreement on the formula. Uh, in addition, the solutions require that basically we should stop using oil or we should reduce it a lot, fossil fuels. Now uh, there are b Seven Sisters uh, is a big cartel of oil companies and they actually run the world even the nobody can make policy which opposes the oil. It's said probably correctly that the uh, Iraq war and the destruction of Libya, these were all acts done by the oil companies to prevent uh, the uh, monopoly from being disturbed by some action that were being done by these companies. So uh, these very powerful organizations which benefit from pollution are preventing st taking steps to prevent it. In fact, they have gone further and they have done uh, um, they uh, create propaganda which creates doubt about climate change. They say that, no, this is not really happening and people are exaggerating and so on, even though it's fairly solidly documented. So as a result, they create confusion in the minds of the public. That, and they 
argue that you know if we put in these uh, environmental restrictions then jobs will be destroyed actually the impact is not so much on jobs as on the corporate profits but uh, they create this uh, propaganda which deceives the public into uh, not taking the steps that are required so uh, when the interests are aligned in favor of uh, uh, basically the corporations that benefit from negative externalities they don't have to pay the costs for their action then because they uh, are benefiting they create campaigns to deny the existence of this externality for example the cigarette industry uh, knew about the cancer potential of cigarettes for many years and then they basically uh, deceived the public uh, put out false and misleading research and uh, prevented the solid research from getting into press so it took a long time for the pub for the public to realize that tobacco do in fact cause cause cancer so there have been <coughs> many successful campaigns by the corporate sector to deny the existence of change and uh, there are two strategies one is the strategy of creating doubt and actually there is an even more aggressive strategy of going out and publishing false research reports and attacking correct research reports as being hoax or junk science uh, there was a recent article about climate change scientists and how they are in high stress because when they publish their findings they are attacked as being scaremongers and and uh, and so uh, they are in a dilemma that they have these findings which are uh, predicting that the planet will collapse and on the other hand they are not allowed to talk about it so they they get very extreme psychological stress and so on uh, jared diamond has written a book called collapse in which he has shown how uh, problems that are created by change societies have been unable to manage even though it was possible to manage and therefore they have collapsed and gone extinct and he gives many examples and it's possible that human kind will also collapse and go extinct because we cannot handle the problems that are being created today one of the problems that uh, is an obstacle to creating solutions is that the economists confuse well-being with absolute consumption so uh, there is a lot of research which uh, shows that happiness has not increased in advanced western countries even though the levels of consumption has have gone up by factors of 10 or more so this is very puzzling to economists because uh, basically the standard economics response is that you know happiness this is just a subjective thing we can we can see that people have refrigerators and washing machines and cars and so this is a this is objective factual the undeniable so it must be the case that people's welfare has gone up maybe they don't maybe they they don't feel better but uh, that's just irrelevant that's a feeling in the heart well, what we can see and count and calculate people's <laughs> welfare has increased so uh, actually um, well being does not depend on absolute consumption but on relative consumption and uh, one uh, standard problem that is arising in environment is that we are uh, creating benefits for this generation at the expense of the next generation which may not be able to live even so the question is there is no market here i mean the next generation cannot trade with us they don't exist so because there is no market so the market efficiency principles don't apply but economists are not aware of this because in their model there is one person who lives forever so automatically he maximizes the sum of discounted utilities and then he is aware that so if you have your standard uh, utility function models then they have this sum of lifetime utilities 
and uh, uh, in the DSG macro models, there's only one person, and he lives forever, so these problems don't exist in economic theory. So, in addition to these production externalities, we also have consumption externalities. That means that if I consume something, then uh, it makes the other people want to consume the same thing. And in fact, uh, envy-driven consumption is a standard uh, methodology for marketing new products, which is also called conspicuous consumption. So, these are called positional externalities. If something is visible, then other people want to emulate it. So, if somebody creates a very brand new product and somebody has it and everybody wants it, then his, crea his creation of this product brings benefit to one person temporarily and it harms the, all the rest. So just like this monopoly where if you sell one good at a lower price, then you have to lower the price on all the goods so the marginal value goes down. So actually there's a huge consumption externality, negative externality. And uh, basically this is what has created a rat race for consumption. People are continuously trying to get ahead. So the basic uh, economic theory is that the um, absolute consumption matters, but the reality which is proven by a lot of different research from a lot of different sources is that relative consumption matters. So as long as everybody is living a simple lifestyle, I will also be happy. And now in that simple lifestyle, if I increase something by a little bit, it will make me very happy. So there is this illusion that because my, my lifestyle is now better than everybody else's. So there is this illusion that everybody has that if I increase my wealth, I will be better off. Because when you compare your increased wealth to everybody else's lower wealth, then you will be uh, better off. And uh, so everybody tries to uh, increase their wealth. As a result, suppose that everybody doubles their wealth, then everybody is in exactly the same place as before, but uh, a huge amount of effort has gone into producing this double wealth. So this is a rat race in which everybody works very, ha works very hard, but nobody gets anywhere. So um, uh, this is because of the wrong belief in absolute consumption. Now, if we understand this problem, then there are many things that we can do. And in fact, in uh, Islamic uh, uh, solution, uh, there are many um, techniques which are told to prevent this problem. One is that richness is the contentment of the heart. Other is that conspicuous consumption is prohibited. You cannot actually buy something with the intention of causing other people to envy it. And um, then also the people who don't have are prohibited to have envy. They said, oh, let everybody have their own thing. You don't have to envy them. So there are many solutions in the Islamic uh, framework uh, to this problem. And uh, simplicity of lifestyle is encouraged. Now in the West, because they don't have these ideas, so the uh, idea that they have, uh, that Helen might discuss is the progressive consumption tax, that basically if somebody is consuming more than the rest, then he's inflicting a negative externality on others. So you should tax that person and as you increase consumption more and more, the tax should increase more and more. And he says that uh, this will have massive efficiency benefits because a lot of consumption is not done out of the uh, pleasure of consuming, but the pleasure of leaving the others behind. And there are other kinds of consumption that uh, instead of goods, which are positional goods, which make other people envy, uh, you can... Uh, you can um, uh, socialize and there are many other goods uh, which which are not positional goods which you can make friends, you can play sports and you can do things which are enjoyable and if there was a huge tax on consumption goods then we would move away from being a consumer society to be a more social society that would bring a lot of benefits because actually in the long run the consumption is just like a drug that you take and it brings you immediate shot of happiness but then in the long run you get addicted to it and you are 
you need that thing for your to keep a normal level whereas the social goods are not like that they bring you long run benefits so uh, now the taxing solution which has been suggested doesn't work it has been proposed and never works why because it's supposed by the rich the um, governments are controlled by the rich and the rich do not want to put have limitations put on their power so the islamic solution is rather different it says that you should prohibit israf and tabzir excess consumption and wasteful consumption and uh, it says that you should feed and clothe your servants and subordinates like yourself so the lifestyle should be the same so if the lifestyle is the same for the high and the low then uh, there will be no problem even uh, or the problem will be much reduced uh even over the 20th century um this uh, consumer society has become much more powerful than in the early 20th century uh people have calculated that the rich man's consumption was maybe about 20 times that of the uh, poor man than in, in in the uh, factories in in the corporations the richest the, the salaries of the richest managers and the uh, poorest worker were on the factor of 22 or 32 uh but over the century the gap has widened tremendously the richest person now earns 150 times more than the laborer and similarly the lifestyle has also become uh much more uh, lavish so the lifestyles of the rich and famous previously uh it was not possible even in islamabad to spend 10000 rupees on a meal because there was no such place you could buy the whole restaurant for food and that because the there was no allowance made for luxurious living but now uh, it is possible to do these things because uh, uh, as people have more and more money ways are being invented to allow them to spend it on themselves previously it was considered bad that why should i eat has it umar radhi allah taala ne said he was eating coarse bread and he was the khalifa of the land so people said that why are you reading this it's very hard to eat with this unrefined flour why don't you use a better quality of bread so he says how can i uh, how can i eat refined bread when not everybody in the umma is capable of eating it so this feeling of social responsibility this is the solution to these problems of concept but this solution doesn't exist in the western textbooks they don't even have a concept that this is possible so there are other ways to uh, and in says since the consumption tax doesn't work uh, one way in 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 the west uh, one way is to break up these production consumption chains in which uh, people have been enslaved that everybody works hard to produce some things now other people have become addicted to the good that is being produced and so this is part of their normal lifestyle and they feel deprived if they don't have it so some people earn money to produce goods for them the other people earn money to buy those goods and uh, to earn money they have to produce other goods which this group buys so basically it's a self sustaining vicious cycle where everybody has to produce goods in order to maintain the lifestyle uh and uh, in order to maintain this lifestyle you have to earn money and to earn money you have to be part of the chain so it's a sort of a circular chain where you are producing a huge amount and you are create uh, getting income and then you need a huge amount of products in order to pay for uh, for the goods that you are accustomed to so a lot of people who have been trapped by these chains have have broken out of them there are people who uh, especially in uh, USA there are people who become credit card uh, um, alcoholics so they start using this because it looks very cheap that here is a good that costs a thousand dollars but cars for example cost five thousand but here I buy it with my credit card and I only have to pay a hundred dollars of course when you pay this hundred dollars a month it turns out that 50 dollars is going on the car and 50 dollars going on interest payments and so eventually when you have to start paying this off 
basically you are you have to work so basically you are enslaved by the banks and uh, a huge amount of population in the financially advanced countries is just working in order to uh, provide profits to the financial companies which have given them loans so this addictive lifestyle uh, so one way to break this up is to say that well don't let people produce as much give them holidays so in europe where they have strong uh, labor unions everyone has one month of vacation so uh, paid vacations and uh, people have more in usa where they have weak labor unions uh, there are a majority of uh, laborers don't have any paid vacations so this is any yani, one possibility but it's also against capitalism which has uh, the benchmark is the more you produce the better off you are uh, this doesn't take into account the problem of relative consumption so another example of real world uh, externality is the air pollution which has been called the corporate violence to the public all is fair in love and war and in the pursuit of profits so uh corporations basically uh kill millions destroy nations just for a few dollars uh it's been calculated there are 2 million deaths every year due to the effects of air pollution but the corporations which pollute the air don't pay the costs for this uh initially when utilities started creating pollution they followed the standard standard strategy of creating doubt that does pollution really cause damage to health well uh, now the medical evidence on this is conclusive and at the same time new and newer products are coming in with hundreds of new chemicals whose effects are unknown a few which have been uh, tested have been found to be very harmful carcinogens and uh um, the book mentions some chemical which is now found in the uh breast milk of mothers in america in large quantities and it is known to be harmful similar issues are arising with gmos uh genetically engineered crops nobody knows the effects of these and actually uh these are being designed in such a way that they take over so once you plant them then the normal crop dies because it has the i mean they have in- engineered them so that it poisons the normal crop so now so that the next time the once once you plant this crop you can't go back to your old crops because the soil is now poisoned against it and that's said by design and now nobody knows whether this thing actually what the long run effects of, of it are maybe it poisons the people as well nobody knows that hasn't been tested for a long time where is the traditional crops we have had for thousands of years so we know that these are safe but these things which are coming up nobody knows what their effects are and they are not tested either another uh, externality is called the is is the workplace health and safety now according to economic theory if there is a job that has risk of death that has high dangers that has high risk then um people will uh, ask for a premium people will uh, yeah. so the risky jobs the difficult jobs the ones which have high risk they 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 will pay higher wages because people will not go into them but the reality is that this is not how it works in the world first of all um uh there is asymmetric information people don't know the risks for second of all when people have to work they have to work this is uh, survival issue so they say okay let it be and let me take the risk so very often the riskiest jobs are the lowest paid job also um angles called it social murder where we murder some of the lower classes in order to provide benefits to the poor uh, to the rich for an example asbestos is a very uh, long run deadly chemical again this has the property that it doesn't immediately cause damage but you breathe in this and it causes lung cancer and it causes a uh, lots of different health problems but it takes a long time so it, it's not immediately visible uh 
as the information has come uh, initially there was a lot of uh, campaign disinformation spreading uh, suppressing the information but eventually this information became known as a result uh, basically canada is one of the biggest exporters the european put, uh, union put bans on the use of it although canada fought very heavily against it to protect not its own citizens but the small lobby of asbestos producers there are only about 1500 jobs in the asbestos sector but for these 1500 jobs but, but the profits are very large so uh, Canada uh, has been fighting against uh, regulations on asbestos and it has been uh, sending exports to the third world where there is no regulation and no, no knowledge about this um, so every year they export about 250,000 tons which results in about 5,000 deaths every year and so basically killing for profits is a common pattern now um, contrary to economic theory economic theory says that okay if you do this um, if you take a job at um, risky factory that means that you know about the risk and you are, this is the price you are willing to pay to accept the risk so as long as you are compensated everything is efficient but there are many serious problems with the economic theory in this one is cognitive dissonance if you are forced to do something then you basically um, deny to yourself the possibility so you say that no these dreamers are exaggerated because you don't have the choice to believe in them because if you believe in them you will be put in a difficult situation so if you're beliefs conflict with the necessities of what you have to do of your actions then you modify one or the other and quite often it's the beliefs that you modify so if you say that oh people just exaggerate the risk of this so for example if somebody is driving on the narrow roads to Naran where there's frequent accidents you will say no no these, these things are exaggerated and there is really no risk if you are a careful driver like me so, uh, if this is true, then there will be no extra pay for risk, and this is what we observe. And uh, another thing that uh, experiments show, especially you see if you look at environmental pollution costs, so one of the things that they, people use is that they say, all right, if, you, um, if we reduce the pollution, this will reduce your risk of dying by... 10% how much would you be willing to pay to achieve this result so you find that people are not willing to pay very much so um, but um, in contradiction to this they say all right suppose that we want to give you a, a risk job where you increase which will increase your uh, your risk of dying by one in a thousand how much would you be willing to accept if I if I give you some money to take a risk to do something which is risky which has a one in thousand chance of time people will say that I will not pay uh, I will not accept a million dollars to do this so now according to economic theory uh, the WT pay and WTA should be equal at the margin but in fact uh, there is no equality and uh, this reflects a lot of different factors about human behavior which are not factored into the economic theory. So the book makes the point that over the uh, last 50 years the rate of death by cancer has increased by a huge amount over the mm, in the industrialized countries and this has been done by choice because choice in the sense that the industrial corporations have introduced carcinogenic materials and used them because these are profitable and they have minimized the if, if they had been paying attention to social costs then they would not have done this so basically again the Islamic model of business says that our goal is to provide service to society and we make profits in order to be able to do this so in an Islamic society with an Islamic mindset this would not have been done 
but in a, a Western society, the idea is the goal is to make profits, and we provide service in order to make profits. So then, if the service is shoddy or deficient, and people buy it, then you still make better profits. So then it becomes, uh, and this is what's happening. So externalities due to the making of profits. So the free markets are very efficient at producing profits, but they are not at helping people. And uh, people who have studied the matter that the industry, um, the private sector promotes uh, unhealthy products and it covers up workplace risks because it wants to hire wages cheaply and uh, it promotes unhealthy lifestyles uh, if they make profit. I mean, they, they have no interest in the public welfare. They're only interested in maximizing profit. So, um, even in the health industry, uh, when the cancer is detected, so the um, medical science is more concerned about how to treat cancer, even though it costs a huge amount of money. And prevention can be done at a much cheaper uh, rate, but prevention is not being done uh, or enough. Lots of money is being poured into how to cure cancer, but very little into how to prevent cancer. Same type of thing in the world. Fisheries are collapsing. There is massive amount of overfishing that is going on. The world's oceans have become polluted. There is a huge amount of... Uh, Species of fish which are completely destroyed. Uh, some types of cod fish used to be caught in tons and tons and now they don't exist anymore. Recently I saw a video about uh, herrings which are in the huge numbers. In, uh, so now actually uh, in the uh, near the Arctic Ocean and then they uh, feed on, on some uh, nutrient rich water over there there they are caught by lion seals and stuff that's not a problem uh, they don't take much but then they come through this area where uh, in Canada where there's only 15 minutes allowed of fishing in one year but in 15 minutes people catch so many using modern techniques that uh, they catch billions of tons and millions of tons of and uh, basically they make enough money for the whole year in, in 15 minutes of mass uh, fishing and after that they get exposed to the whales it was it was <laughs> after the humans are through through with them then the whales come in to, for their catch so so then the uh, text mentions that there are externalities in finance which everybody knows about um, and I will discuss that a little bit more later in a separate so basically, there is a battle between regulation and deregulation. Uh, regulation is good for the public and deregulation is good for finance. And um, deregulated finance has, can uh, make a lot of private profits by causing a lot of damage to the people. And that's what they did in uh, the global financial crisis, where they made a trillion dollars while the public lost something similar. So the profit motive itself, this idea that greed is good, which is uh, which is written in uh, the opening uh, paragraphs of Manicure and almost all textbooks preach this message that you should just be selfish, and being selfish is good for society. This is just uh, this is also called the invisible hand. This is completely false. Uh, and uh, now the thing is that you have to think who. Suppose we say that there is the, the basically the free market is the idea of laissez-faire. Let everybody do whatever they want to do. Let everybody be free. Now, on the surface, this seems like a very equitable philosophy. Then, and in fact, it is sold as such. Uh, Milton Friedman wrote this book for the public called "Free to Choose," where he said everybody should have freedom of choice. Why? Why should we impose restrictions? So basically, the mm, uh, when uh, corporations push a measure, they push it 
on behalf of the public. They say this is going to help the public when, when actually it is something which helps uh, only them and hurts the public. So this is needed to get the public to cooperate. And economic theory works in the same way. It says that this thing is efficient, the supply and demand gives reduces efficiency, when in fact it harms the interests of the poor and helps the interests of the rich. So um, this laissez-faire philosophy, if you just think about it of, uh, for your, on your own, who will this benefit? Obviously it benefits the powerful, because if you say let everybody act freely, then those people who are in power will be able to do a lot. Those people who are powerless and moneyless, uh, they are free to do nothing because there is nothing they can do. So freedom is, is a, uh, offhand on, on top of it. Freedom looks like uh, an equalizing concept that everybody is free, but actually freedom is a very unequal concept. So regulation, regulation is actually regulating the power of the rich and the wealthy to exploit the poor. But uh, this profit motive has been legitimized successfully by economics texts that there is nothing wrong with pursuit of profit to the extent that even Muslim scholars, even ulama say that there is nothing wrong with pursuing profits. Islam allows it. Actually, um, Islam allows it but under very strict conditions that you can earn money provided that you, uh, it is for a good purpose. You cannot earn money uh, you cannot make money, uh, collection of money the goal for in and of itself. This is not permissible. Earning money is allowed if you are going to use that money for some halal jayas purpose, including feeding yourself and family. This is also halal jayas and uh, permissible and uh, in fact a right purpose. But um, just collecting money for the sake of collecting money is not permitted in Islam. And this is the central driving force in capitalist society. So free markets have led to disasters everywhere by overconsumption. Uh, people just consume a huge, a huge amount of unnecessary products are produced and people are made to feel that they must have these things and so people overconsume, and this creates uh, production consumption chains in which people are addicted to higher levels and they get they work and the only one which profits is the corporations which make a profit on the production and make a profit on the labor and uh, overfishing is okay so I'm going to um, now uh, have a separate set of slides about the uh,